I'm Thomas Steiner and I'm going to explain how discounting is done. Discounting is very important for judging the socio-economic importance of long-run problems. Take for instance the storage of nuclear waste or the drowning of uh, productive lands in Bangladesh or in New York or in London by rising sea level as a result of climate change. These will be very large costs, but they will occur quite far into the future, maybe in 100 years or so. If we have a cost of, say, a million, 140 years away, then with conventional discounting at a 10% rate, that would be worth much less than a dollar today. Many people think this is intuitively unreasonable, um, and so we have to be very careful when we work out what the discount rate should be and in fact whether or not it should be a constant discount rate. So I'm going to explain some of the fundamentals of what we refer to as the Ramsey Rule. We start with assuming an intertemporal welfare function. This means that everything about the future is summed up in one welfare function where the utility, the stream of utilities that we get from consumption each year are summed up and then discounted at the utility discount rate, rho. Uh, rho sort of here is um, a discount rate that reflects how much less we care about the future than about today. Um, it's perhaps easier to see this in a discrete time formulation where you can see that we have a stream of say consumption uh, every year CT and then the utility we get from that is U of CT and welfare is simply the sum of the utility we get from this year's consumption plus the utility we get from next year's consumption divided by this discount factor the utility discount factor rho, and so forth. Now, some people think that rho should perhaps be zero, or at least very, very small. Many people think, in fact, that we should care more about our children and future generations than about ourselves. And there are many philosophical arguments about this. There is, of course, a small risk each year that life on Earth is disappears for other reasons than our own doing. And so that is sometimes cited as, a, as an argument for a row, but it would be a row that is incredibly small. In fact, if you like, you can think of it as being zero, but we're going to include it here since there are many people who think that it still exists and it's important to treat that our, our mathematical treatment is complete. But the fact is that even if we think that rho should be zero, there may still be reasons for discounting. And the reason for that is that the utility curve is not straight. It is bent, as you can see in this curve here. The utility of money to rich people is smaller than to poor people. If you see big bills, lying on the floor, then you can be quite sure that you're um, in the home of someone who has plenty of money. Or in a district where people on average have lots of money. Otherwise people would obviously pick, pick up the bill. If people don't bother to pick up the bill, they must be very rich. Very rich people, for them, may be an extra um, hundred dollars is not so important. So that is the meaning of this curvature of this utility function. You can see here the marginal utility is falling. The marginal utility of an extra dollar for a really rich person is much smaller than for a poor person. I think that's, that's fairly intuitive. This also means that the curvature of the utility function sort of reflects our inversion to risk and our inversion to inequality. 
And we can illustrate this by thinking about the point M. We would prefer being two years at the point M than having one year at the year X and one year at the year Z, level Z. Z. Um, and basically, if we think of this in welfare terms, we would prefer two people to be at M than one at X and one at Z. The average of X and Z is below M. This, this curve is convex. Now, the pure rate of time preference that I spoke about before, rho, would imply that a stream, a constant stream of consumption, if we every year have the same consumption, then this is still worth less due to utility discounting. And some people don't believe in the utility discounting, as I've already said. But on top of the utility discounting, if we live in a world where we think that we will get richer and richer every year, where we believe that there is growth in the economy, then this implies that in the future people will be richer than what we are today. And richer people have less benefit of money. And therefore, an extra dollar in the year 2050 is worth less than an extra dollar today, simply because those people in the year 2050, on average, will be richer than we are. So now you see there are two arguments for discounting. One is that we just, in general, maybe care less about the future than about the present. Uh, and another argument for that is, is the impatience of human nature. Most people, if there's a good thing, they would prefer to have it today than to have to wait a year. And if it's a bad thing, they prefer to have it later. Um, on top of that argument is then the argument that the future people would be richer, and richer people don't really understand the value of money. So for both these two reasons together, a dollar in the year 2050 or 2100 is worth less than a dollar today. Note, however, that if the whole world's economy were going down the drain and we were getting poorer and poorer, then the opposite would apply. So this all hinges on the argument that we think there is growth. I mean, this, consider the discrete case. Consider a long row of years, 1920, 21, 22, 23, and so forth. And then just pick out two of those years, say 21 and 22, and keep everything else constant. And we could, conceptually, you could imagine you might be able to move a few hundred dollars of consumption from 2020 to 2021. Would that be a good thing or a bad thing? Well, the rate at which you would have to compensate the people in 2021 for the losses in 2020 would depend on the slope of, of the two curves here that you see here. There's one that reflects our preferences and one that reflects our, our production possibilities. Where they meet and the tangent at that point reflects uh, the discount rate. In words, all this means that we're looking for a change in the marginal utility of consumption. And I want you to think very carefully about this function. It looks simple enough. U of C of T. Suppose we move a little consumption from the year T, uh, well now not in years really, but in, in, in continuous time, from the moment T to the moment T plus epsilon. But the question is, what is the rate of change in the value of money. Or put this in another way, how fast does the UDC change? This is not really mathematically too difficult for you, but conceptually it's important to really understand what you're doing. So we will write the UDC as U prime of C. That's one concept you need to keep in, in mind the marginal utility of consumption, or the marginal utility of money, which, remember, was going down. Rich people care less. 
And then think of the, just the term rate of change. And just take any variable z. What is the rate of change? Well, the rate of change is dz dt divided by z. So in this case, what we are looking for, the discount rate, is the time derivative of the consumption derivative of utility, that is the time derivative of the marginal utility of consumption, divided by the marginal utility of consumption. Once you figure out what it is you're looking for, it's not that hard to take the derivatives. So utility is u of c of t, marginal utility is u prime of c of t, and the time derivative of that is the second derivative of u multiplied by dc dt. And we can rewrite that formula a little bit. You just look carefully. I multiplied one little part by c and I divided another part by c again. And this makes it possible to write this discount rate as the product of alpha, sometimes also called gamma in the literature here, which is the curvature of the utility function, or the elasticity of the marginal utility with respect to consumption, times the growth rate. Now the growth rate is simpler. That's the term on, on the right there. You have dc dt divided by c. That's simple enough. That's, we're calling that g, the growth rate, the expected growth rate, in fact, in the future. Look at the term to the left. It's the derivative of the marginal utility of consumption with respect to consumption, and then multiplied by consumption divided by marginal utility. That's the definition of a elasticity of marginal utility. It is an expression of the curvature of the utility function. The more curved it is, this is the less rich people care about money, um, the more important is alpha, and the bigger would be the optimal discount rate, in fact. Because if people are going to get richer at a rate g, and if rich people really care less and less very quickly about, about money, then, of course, the future people who would be richer, it really won't matter very much to them if we leave them costs. So then we can discount those costs. But if, on the other hand, you believe that alpha is quite small, the utility curve is quite flat, then uh, the discount rate will be lower. Now, we're going to put together these two parts, the utility discounting with the consumption discounting. Uh, look again at um, welfare. Welfare was utility discounted with this Rho, the utility discount rate, the impatience. Now, we're doing the same exercise again. Assume we move a little consumption from t to t plus epsilon. What is now the rate of loss of the discounted marginal utility that we call welfare? We do basically the exact same calculation as you saw before, and I suggest you look carefully at the formulas. Just follow the change we have made as we have changed u for w. We have introduced e to the power minus rho t. The rho turns up in these derivations in one or two places. And the consequence is that the discount rate at the end is rho plus alpha times g. This is the Ramsey rule. The rate of discount is the sum of two terms. The first of those terms is impatience, or just uh, our selfishness, if you like. How much we care more about our own utility than about the future. The other term is the sum, is the product of, of two terms. The growth rate, which reflects how much richer future generations will be. And then alpha, which is an expression of how much less rich people care about money. 
So these three terms determine how much we should discount. And note they don't have to be constant. So the discount rate could in fact be falling. There is a lot of recent literature which suggests that the discount rate perhaps that we should be using might start at something like 3% and might fall down to something more like 1% over a couple of decades. Um, but that's um, outside this lecture, so I, I leave that for future reading and future lectures. Here is the Ramsey rule once more. And um, I suggest you read a little bit more on this. Thank you.